from the ash-covered wastelands of Skadriel to the raging high storms of Russia. The vast transplanetary world of the Cosmere is one of the most ambitious literary undertakings in fiction. The brainchild of modern fantasy phenomenon Brandon Sanderson, this shared universe is where iconic series like Mistborn, Elantris, and the Stormlight Archive take place. It is chock full of imaginative magic systems, capricious gods, ongoing mysteries, and heroic clashes which strike to the very core of what makes modern fantasy the juggernaut that it is today. As we plan to talk about Brandon Sanderson's fantastic worlds and stories in various upcoming series, we should first explain the common rules and concepts of the shared universe where they all take place. Welcome to the Wizards and Warriors channel's introduction to the Cosmere. In this video, we will talk about the Cosmere universe and its metaphysics, and will cover the first era of Skadriel, the world of Mistborn. As we hear tales of heroes fulfilling their goals, it makes one wish they could experience it themselves just a little, and we're actually sponsored today by a game you can play even while you watch this video. It's a mobile RPG game that makes everything you do contribute to your power and progress, so it always feels good to play. It's Hero Wars. It starts off simple. You build a team of five heroes and send them to battle through enemies in the campaign mode earning level-ups and loot, which you use to upgrade and progress further and faster. Soon you'll be strategizing about which combinations of heroes and gear are best for the challenging bosses standing in your way. Classic mobile RPG fun, but here it's not some pay-to-win or ad-infested experience, it's a genuine free-to-play game about honing your strategic thinking, and you'll find a large community to fight or cooperate with too giving the game an MMO feel with players from all walks of life who can help you with the legendary raids and bosses that lie ahead. Oh yeah, I almost forgot, here's a question for you. Where can you get 30,000 coins, 600 emeralds and 5 awesome heroes to start dominating in Hero Wars right away? Too slow, the answer is in the link in the description below. Play Hero Wars now! Although much has yet to be revealed of the inner workings of the Cosmere, we know that much of the creation of this universe centers around a single entity, Adenelsium, a divine, godlike being, whose exact nature Sanderson has yet to elaborate upon. Whatever Adenelsium was, however, it essentially served as the Cosmere's power of creation, which permeated through all things within the universe. Long before the Cosmere came to exist in its current form, a group of 16 mortals came together and conspired to destroy God. The events surrounding the murder of Adenalsium are shrouded in mystery. However, within the Cosmere, the only true certainty is that nothing can ever truly be destroyed, only changed. Thus, rather than be wiped entirely from existence, the power of Adenalsium was sundered into 16 shards, each one an aspect of his personality. These shards were Devotion, Dominion, Preservation, Ruin, Odium, Cultivation, Honor, Endowment, Autonomy, Ambition, Invention, Mercy, Valor, and Whimsy. Each of the gods' 16 mortal murderers claimed one of the shards, becoming known as the Shardholders, and coming to possess a fragment of divinity. In short, the 16 had killed their deity, and in doing so, had become gods themselves. There was a god, Adenalsium. I don't know if it was a force or a being, though I suspect the latter. Sixteen people, together, killed Adenalsium, ripping it apart and dividing its essence between them, becoming the first who ascended. Chris to Kelsia. The Shardholders scattered, either creating their own worlds, or settling on worlds Adenalsium had created before his murder. There they expanded upon Adenalsium's initial creations, with worlds they came to reside upon, becoming known as Shard Worlds. Where the Shards settled, they brought with them massive amounts of investiture, the spiritual energy which empowers all of the Cosmere's forms of magic. Indeed, each of the worlds which came to be inhabited by a Shard developed magic systems powered by investiture, with the form and nature of their magic determined by the influence of the Shard Holder on that world. This serves to explain why, within a single universe, each world differs so greatly in the magic they are capable of utilizing, from the stormlight-powered surge binding of Roshar, to the metallic allomancy of Skadriel. 
The concept of investiture is vital in understanding the functioning of the shards and their impact on the individual denizens of the Cosmere. Investiture is essentially the common denominator in the otherwise vastly different, seemingly unrelated forms of magic in this universe, and everyone who resides within the confines of the Cosmere is invested in some manner or another. Despite their omnipotent presence in all of Sanderson's stories, the Shards of Adonalsium are mysterious beings who we don't know much about. As previously mentioned, each is named after a specific action or ideal, which is known as an intent. Moreover, the Shard itself is not the same entity as the mortal who bears it. A Shard must always be controlled by an individual mind, and when a person holds a Shard, the power which resides within it imbues the individual. Currently, some shards are still held by their original claimant, while other shards have changed bearers over the millennia. When the original 16 each claimed their shards, they were unaware of the impact that harnessing such power would have on them. The power of divinity overwhelmed them, and they became overcome by an overwhelming desire to follow the intent of their individual shard. This caused conflict across the planets of the Cosmere, for while shards with more peaceful intent, like honor, cultivation and preservation, had a mandate to ensure peace and growth on the worlds they inhabited, shards with more passionate intent, like odium and ruin, were often sources of conflict, destruction and chaos on those selfsame worlds. Let us now shift our narrative away from the shards of Adonalsium and tackle the other complex way in which this universe is divided by diving into the esoteric beast that is realmatic theory. On top of being transplanetary, the Cosmere is also a multi-dimensional universe, which exists on three different planes of reality, known as realms, the physical realm, the cognitive realm, and the spiritual realm. We don't sleep, we don't eat, I think we might feed off humans, actually, your emotions, or you thinking about us, maybe. It all seems very complicated. In Shadesmar, we can think on our own, but if we go to your realm, we need a human bond. Otherwise, we're practically as mindless as those glory spren. Sulfrena on the nature of spren. The physical realm is the most easily understood realm, as it is the world in which mortals, humans withstanding, inhabit. The spiritual realm is the realm of the soul. It is believed that this realm acts as the afterlife for the denizens of the Cosmere. The spiritual is by far the most mysterious of the three realms, and it is not certain if even the shardholders themselves can access this realm fully. In this realm, every person has what is known as a spirit web, which is made up of a latticework of lines, but the individual shape of each person's spirit web differs. The cognitive realm is much better documented, but tricky to fully understand. It's known to the people of Russia as Shadesmar, and is the realm of thoughts and ideas made manifest. It is the home of various immortal-ish beings called Spren, sentient fragments of the power of creation associated with some aspect of nature or human personality. The cognitive realm can be used in a process called world hopping. The individual worlds of the Cosmere are much closer to one another within this realm than in the physical realm, and a world hopper can effectively walk to other planets. The most important world hopper throughout the Shard Worlds is Hoyd. However, in the interests of avoiding speculation and conjecture as to his true being and purpose, we will not delve too deeply into his story. A further qualifying factor in world hopping is that a perpendicularity, in essence a magical gate at the junction of the three realms, is needed to move from world to world. Perpendicularities form only where investiture is extremely concentrated and as such are usually found where a shard holder is concentrating their power. At these points, physical matter, cognitive thought and spiritual essence become one, and a being can slide between realms. Excerpt from Chris's essay on the Dromenad system. Within the Cosmere itself, there are countless inhabited worlds, although only ten of which are known to be inhabited by shards of Adonalsium, thus having their own soul and a unique magic system as a result. Of the ten shard worlds, nine have been revealed by Brandon. We will first travel to the ash-covered Scadriel, which provides the setting for the Mistborn series and is the residence of the shards Preservation and Ruin. 
The conflict between these two shards has led to an exceptionally powerful form of investiture centered around the manipulation of metal, which takes the forms of hemallurgy, allomancy, and ferrucamy. The position of the planet is also subject to change, as certain exceptional individuals in Skadriel's history have gained access to vast amounts of power in the past, allowing them to literally move the planet. Our story begins when Ruin and Preservation, two shards of the shattered god Adonalsium, made their way to an empty star system within the Cosmere. Although the two beings were inherently at odds with one another, they struck a bargain to work together, creating the planet Skadriel. The bargain struck was harsh for Preservation, who had to give up a segment of himself in the process, leaving him far weaker than his counterpart and essentially ensuring that Ruin would eventually destroy the planet they had just created. Due to the influence of Ruin and Preservation, the people of Skadriel were capable of practicing three distinct forms of investiture. Allomancy, focused on the ingestion of various metals, granted the user powers based on the metal ingested, such as strength from pewter and future sight in the case of Etium. Any individual who could only use one form of metal was known as a misting, but those who could make use of all the metals and the powers attached to them were referred to as a mistborn. Hemallurgy focused on the transfer of certain characteristics of allomancy or ferrochemy through metallic spikes, which were inserted into certain points on a person's body, requiring a connection with moving blood in order to add or subtract the attribute in question. Ferrochemy, which was practiced by the ancient Terris people, was far more in balance than either of the aforementioned methods being equally attuned to both ruin and preservation. It operated by transferring certain characteristics into pieces of metal, which could be retrieved later when required. Examples of this include the transfer of strength into a metal band. However, this would require the fairing to deprive themselves of said strength as it was being transferred, leaving them weak and borderline powerless during the process. Knowing that ruin would eventually turn on Skadriel, and unwilling to see his most precious creation destroyed, Preservation broke the agreement between them, sacrificing his mind and in doing so, imprisoning Ruin. Furthermore, to balance their respective powers, Preservation separated an element of Ruin's power, placing it within the metal Atium. Ruin's prison came to be known as the Well of Ascension. However, this prison was not infallible. Every 1,024 years, its perpendicularity would fill, usually taking the form of a pool of liquid. Whenever the perpendicularity of the Well of Ascension emerged, a mortal individual had to take it up. This was perilous, for if they gave it up, it would free ruin. The individual who was to take up the power was to be known as the Hero of Ages. In spite of his imprisonment, Ruin could still exercise a modicum of his power, affecting the wider world in a number of small yet decisive ways. For example, he was capable of altering anything that was written down on a material which was not metal, the most important of which were the Terris prophecies, preserved by the Worldbringers, the spiritual leaders of the Terris people. The Terris prophecies had been created by preservation to ultimately defeat Ruin and foretold the Hero of Ages taking up the power of the Well of Ascension and using it to save Skadriel. During this classical era, the Kingdom of Kalenium rose in prominence and drew to its streets the man who would become known as the Hero of Ages, Alendi. The son of a blacksmith, Alendi left the tiny village he called home and made his way to Kalenium some 16 years before the Well of Ascension refilled. When the well eventually refilled, Ruin became increasingly powerful, exerting his influence upon Skadriel in what was referred to as the Deepness. Due to the mist that began blighting the countryside, many considered this to be an apocalyptic event. In truth, though, this phenomenon was merely Preservation's way of revealing the allomantic powers of the residents of Skadriel, a process called snapping. However, in invoking the snapping, Preservation had miscalculated. He had believed that Ruin would destroy the mist. Instead, Ruin strengthened it, and in doing so, turned it into a phenomenon which blocked off sunlight, destroyed crops, and killed people who ventured out into it. As the situation continued to worsen, Alendi, the prospective hero of ages, met a world-bringer named Kawan 
and apprenticed himself to him. During this time, Elendi began to increasingly show signs that he was the hero of prophecy. The world bringers initially scorned Kawan for this, believing Elendi to be a false hero. But they were slowly convinced, after Ruin used his influence to alter prophecies in order to fit Elendi's description. A man with a birthmark on his arm and whose hair had turned completely grey by 25. Elendi would go on to become the king of Kalenium, and from there would unite the nations of Skadriel, most importantly Terris, mostly by diplomacy but also through conquest. As a result, bearing a dissenting minority, he was able to create a united front to face Ruin's deepness in short order. After a few decades leading Skadriel's united armies against the forces of Ruin's deepness, the world bringers of Terris would finally accept Elendi as the Hero of Ages and allow him to make his way to the Well of Ascension. However, the prophecies had been altered by Ruin, and instead of saying that the hero had to hold the power born of the Well of Ascension, it now dictated that the Hero of Ages would be required to resist the temptation of such ultimate power and give it up for the greater good of humanity. Of course, by doing this, the hero would unwittingly release Ruin from Preservation's prison. Elendi soon left in order to make his way to the well. However, his travels and years spent fighting for what seemed to be a dying world had changed him. He retained his fundamentally good heart, but in his logbook he wrote the ominous phrase, Sometimes I worry that I'm not the hero everyone thinks I am. Once he arrived in Terris, Elendi replaced his normal retinue with Terris Pacmen, whose capacity to make use of ferrochemy would prove vital in making their way up the harsh and unforgiving mountain. Among them was a young Terrisman named Rishek, who was the nephew of Quan. Rishek believed that Elendi was not the hero of ages, and resented him as an outsider and an oppressor of his people who had fooled the world bringers to gain ultimate power. Unbeknownst to Elendi, Kwan, who had figured out that Ruin had altered the prophecies, had given secret orders to Rishek to prevent Elendi reaching the Well of Ascension at all costs. The trip was perilous, with each member of the expedition risking their lives on every treacherous slope of the mountain. If not for the Farukami of the Terrismen, it is unlikely that they would have reached the peak. The trek was not without incident either, as Fedik, a member of Elendi's retinue, was stabbed by a mist spirit either representing ruin or preservation after discovering ruin's perpendicularity. Continuing onwards, Elendi could hear pulses emanating from the well due to his ability as an allomantic seeker, which thwarted Rashek's attempts to lead Elendi the wrong way. Thus, with no other recourse, when the party reached the Well of Ascension, Rishek murdered Elendi. Ignominiously, the King of Kalenium and would-be saviour of Skadriel died upon those frozen peaks with doubt in his heart. In spite of his faults and the treachery of ruin challenging him at every step, Elendi proved himself to be of the finest quality even in his final moments, a stark contrast to the harsh and violent Rishek who entered the Well of Ascension. Here, the young Terrisman was to take the power of preservation and ascend to become the Lord Ruler of Skadriel, impersonating Elendi and making the people believe him to be the Hero of Ages. The power was unlike anything a human could ever experience, as it was derived from a shard of Adenalcium, granting godlike characteristics to its wielder. From his new perspective, Rishek, in spite of his inferior character to Elendi, recognized that action must be taken to save the world from the deepness. He began to change the composition of Skadriel in order to counter its threats, yet he was but a child in such matters, and much of what he did to save the world presented further challenges which brought Skadriel closer to destruction. In order to burn the ruins choking mists away, he moved Skadriel closer to the sun. However, this altered orbit was far too close to the immense heat of such a star and almost destroyed all sapient life on the planet. Frantically attempting to remedy his failure, Rashek raised numerous large volcanoes, which would become known as ash mounts. They would produce enough ash and smoke in order to cool down the planet and prevent its imminent destruction. Once more, this presented further issues, as the ash would have to be broken down otherwise it would choke the very air, destroying the ecosystem of the planet. Recognizing this would not be enough, 
Rishik was forced to alter the very physiology of the humans residing on his planet in order to make them capable of resisting the harsher, more apocalyptic conditions he himself had created. All of Rashek's changes reflected his inner darkness and desire for control. For example, among the surviving people of Skadriel, social changes were implemented, namely a strict caste system between the nobility and the Scar of what was to be his final empire. The nobility were altered, becoming taller, stronger and more intelligent, while simultaneously being less fertile in order to make them easier to control. By way of comparison, the Scar, who were to be the lowest class possible in the final empire, were changed to be shorter, more fertile and hardier, providing the workforce and peasantry of the empire. Furthermore, seeing the threat of Farukami to his rule, Rashek changed the Farukamists into mist wraiths, mindless beings charged with wandering the mists aimlessly. However, his personal friends among the Farukamists were spared this fate, for Rashek had changed them into Kandra, allowing them to retain their minds and providing them the capability of shapeshifting by using the bodies of other humans or animals through hemorrhagic spikes. However, Rashek had failed to account for the dormant Farukami genes within the Terrace people, allowing for the return of this art in the coming generations. Other beings that Rashek was able to create with Hemology were the Koloss and the Inquisitors, who formed the backbone of his armies and secret police force respectively. Koloss were created by placing four hemorrhagic spikes through a human body at certain points, and were immensely strong and hardy despite their distinct lack of intelligence, with rumours that they could only be controlled by the Lord Ruler. These warriors towered over the ordinary human and were clad in blue skin. They continued to grow throughout the entirety of their lives, despite the fact their skin volume did not increase, resulting in tearing and ripping as they grew ever larger. Inquisitors, meanwhile, were considered to be the peak of hemorrhagic power, being able to practice all of the allomantic powers as well as some of those inherent within a Farukamist. Of all the spikes an Inquisitor receives, most prominent of all are the two driven through their eyes meaning they could only see by constantly burning steel and or iron. The Inquisitors would form part of the Steel Ministry, an organization which spread the worship of the Lord Ruler as a deity, a religion which spread quickly throughout the rebuilt Skadriel. No other religion was tolerated, and all who practiced them were hunted down and destroyed, with the last surviving religion, the Valar, being destroyed in the 5th century of his millennium-long rule. As his final act with the power of the Well of Ascension, Rishek rebuilt himself to become a fully-fledged Mistborn by condensing some of the power into the Beads of Lorassium, which emerged in the pool after doing so. With such immense power coursing through his veins, the Lord Ruler became aware of life on other planets throughout the Cosmere, and if he had wished it, he could have left Skadriel behind. The final empire was formed as the ultimate act of vengeance against the peoples he believed had oppressed Terris by encroaching upon their land. The Lord Ruler would lead his armies on a bloody path of conquest, his obsession with order driving him to destroy all who refused to acknowledge him as their ruler and god. All but ten kings he deemed worthy were brought to their knees. The following ten were turned into mistborn through the Beads of Lorassium to rule over the masses of Scar within his empire at the head of the Great Houses. Attempts at rebellion or even the assassination of the Lord Ruler were always doomed to failure due to the immense power he had garnered at the Well of Ascension. Early attempts at resisting Rashek centered around fighting for the survival of one's religion or country. However, as the centuries passed on, the common identity of the Scar and their oppression became the defining factor in such revolts. This culminated in the Massacre of Tugir, which occurred in the 7th century of the Final Empire and resulted in the slaughter of 7,000 Scar at the hands of the Lord Ruler. The immortal knowledge that Rashek had garnered allowed him to recognize that Ruin would someday be given another chance to emerge from his prison. As such, during his rule, the Lord Ruler made contingencies creating five storage caches throughout the final empire with large supplies of food and other such necessities, as well as information about Alamancy which only he possessed, and information pertaining to the weaknesses of his hemologic constructs such as the Kandra, Kolos and Inquisitors. 
These were to be used if he was deposed prior to the power returning to the Well of Ascension. The empire was further divided into several dominances, with the capital Luthadel as well as the seven ash mounts being contained within the central dominance. The population soon soared to a hundred million citizens, and recognizing the need to maintain order with such a vast population, technological advances were suppressed, with anyone who discovered gunpowder immediately sentenced to death. The nobility were controlled by continuously placing them at odds with one another in a great game of sorts, while also controlling the supply of the beads of Atium, whose innate alimentic powers could be the deciding factor in any conflict between the houses. Despite all of the Lord Ruler's draconian policies, the spark of resistance had not entirely faded, and would see new life in Marsh and Kelsia, bastards of a dalliance between a noble father and a Scar mother. Marsh became the leader of the Scar resistance, whereas Kelsia, who hated his brother, instead joined a gang of misting thieves in order to steal directly from the great houses, falling in love with and marrying another member of the group, Mare. Kelsia's arrogance would be his downfall, however, when he dreamed up the greatest of all heists, the taking of the Lord Ruler's Atium supply within his residence at Credic Shore. This would inevitably fail, with the Lord Ruler himself openly thanking Mare for helping them to apprehend the thieves, leading to the false belief that his wife had betrayed him. Kelsia was then sent to the pits of Hathsin alongside Mare in order to mine Atium, which was effectively a death sentence as all who were sent to such a duty would be executed if they could not find one Atium geode a week. When the week came in which Kelsia could not find such a geode, Mare lied, claiming she had found two, and giving up her geode. She was brutally beaten to death by the guards in front of Kelsia, who was beaten for his protestations, causing him to snap. Using his newly found powers as a mistborn, Kelsia killed the guards and escaped the pits of Hathsin, becoming the first such scar to do so, and earning the moniker the Survivor of Hathsin, a title which reignited the hope of the scar people for a fairer world outside of the tyranny of the Lord Ruler. Kelsia emerged from the pits of Hathsin a different man. He maintained his easy smile and cheery demeanor, yet the scars he now bore upon his arms marked him out as the Survivor of Hathsin a figure who would inspire hope and fear in equal measure among those he would come across. Snapping had also revealed Kelsia to be a mistborn, a man capable of making use of all the metals and their respective alloys, compared to a misting who could only use a single such metal. The fellow mistborn Gemmel, who was less than sane, agreed to train Kelsia. The two men began their journey north to infiltrate Keep Shesla in Mantis, where Antilius Schesler was conducting experiments on the Scar. During their trip, Gemmel trained Kelsia by explaining his powers and randomly attacking his pupil. Kelsia was an adept student and quickly became more proficient with his gifts. The training primarily focused on pushing steel and pulling iron. Gemmel also taught Kelsia to think like an allomancer, showing him how to burn all eight basic metals simultaneously. When they reached the keep, Gemmel went first to gain a better view, and made his way to the rooftop for a better vantage point, killing several guards. Here they observed a stairway leading downwards. Kelsia headed down first, hoping to enter the keep stealthily. However, his master ignored this sentiment and killed two guards. In the next room they discovered half a dozen Scar who had been bound, and Kelsia began to tend to them. This was interrupted by Antilius Schesler, who arrived after hearing the commotion caused by Gemmel. A fully-fledged mistborn, he immediately attacked Kelsia using steel pushing on a coin. Gemmel saw this as a further training opportunity and decided not to intervene. Kelsia displayed his prodigious talent in the ensuing fight, besting a man with a far greater degree of training and killing Antilius. Kelsia quickly returned to unbinding the scar, while Gemmel read through a notebook belonging to the now deceased nobleman which had several theories and superstitions regarding an eleventh metal. After freeing the Scar, Kelsia took the book and the duo escaped the keep. In the intervening period, Kelsia found the eleventh metal, Melatium, believing it held the key to defeating the Lord Ruler. To his disappointment, its immediate uses were less than clear, leading him to return to his initial plan. 
Firstly, he took into his employ the Kandra or Asur, then he killed the noble lord Tevin Renault of the Farmos dominance, allowing his Kandra ally to impersonate him. Following this, he made his way to the headquarters of the Scar Rebellion, which his brother Marsh had once headed, and convinced the new leader, Yedin, to hire him to help bring down the Lord Ruler. Heading towards Luthadel, Kelsia stopped at a farm owned by Lord Themos Tresting to speak with the Scar who worked the fields. While he was there, Lord Tresting attempted to rape a Scar girl, and in response, Kelsia murdered the Lord, which forced the Scar there to join the rebellion. Arriving in Luthadel, Kelsia first met with his old partner Doxon, Dox, who informed him of a young Alamansa girl Marsh had discovered, who he suspected to be a mistborn. The two men went to see her firsthand, witnessing her calm down an obligator, the Lord Ruler's Steel Ministry bureaucrat. This confirmed that she was at least a soother, a misting capable of pushing brass to soothe. However, soon they realized that a Steel Inquisitor had also been present and discovered Vin's alamancy, and that Kelsius' crew was also observing. The Inquisitor and a group of soldiers planned on wiping out Kelsius' crew to nip any rebellion in the bud. Kelsia intervened, distracting the Inquisitor while Doxon handled the soldiers. Kelsia and Dox then offered Vin a chance to join their crew, and despite her suspicious nature, she reluctantly agreed to learn more about Alamancy. Vin was a half-scar mistborn, a product of a dalliance of a noble with his scar mistress, who was raised by her half-brother, Reen. The Lord Ruler prohibited the nobles from lying with the scar, as the resulting intercourse often led to the birth of the mistings. To save himself, the noble had Vin's mother and sister murdered and tried to find Vin. Vin, like Kelsia, was a mistborn. However, she snapped during her difficult birth, making her highly attuned to her powers. Kelsia invited a team of the finest thieves in all of Luthadel to the crew's hideout. Here, he introduced them to Yedin, Vin and his crew, and revealed the broad outlines of a plan to bring down the final empire and kill the Lord Ruler. Breeze was the soother of the crew, in charge of manipulating people's emotions while burning brass. Ham was a thug whose strength was significantly enhanced when burning pewter. Clubs was a smoker who, when burning copper, formed an invisible copper cloud, blocking the sense of seekers who burned bronze. This allowed other Alamancers to practice without being detected, and made him immune to the emotional Alamancy of soothing and rioting while burning. His nephew, Spook, was a tin eye, which granted him increased sensitivity in all five senses and the ability to see through the mists. Under Kelsia's guidance, the crew began to flesh out the initial plan breaking each element down to make the insurmountable seem attainable. The plan eventually formulated. A force of some 20,000 trained Scar was to be trained in the arduous caverns. Simultaneously, the crew would sow discord and discontent between the noble houses to bring about a civil war. When the army was sufficiently trained, and the civil war caused the houses to become unstable enough, the forces of the rebellion would be sent to attack the pits of Hathsin, to cut the flow of Atium. This potent metal allowed the Mistborn user to see an opponent's future attacks before they happened, and its distribution allowed the Lord Ruler to control the houses. After the pits were attacked, the garrison would be sent out from Luthadel. With the garrison out of the capital and the houses weakened sufficiently, the rest of the rebel army could take the city, with the crew receiving the Lord Ruler's Atium stash as a reward for their efforts. Roles were then doled out, with Breeze charged with recruiting soldiers, Doxon operating the crew's finances, clubs hiding their alamancy through his copper clouds, and a former soldier Ham training the new army. Orisur, impersonating Lord Renault, would then buy the required equipment. Marsh was to infiltrate the Steel Ministry, posing as an obligator, and Kelsia, the most powerful Mistborn among them, would orchestrate attacks on the noble houses to increase tensions between them. Vin's role was to pose as Renault's niece Valette among the nobles, to gain information critical to the cause. Kelsia also wished to kill the Lord Ruler with the Eleventh Metal, but remained uncertain how this could be accomplished. He considered this as naught but a voluntary bonus. Setting about his work with his trademark optimism, Kelsia first attacked the keep of the noble Venture, one of the strongest houses, tasked with overseeing the Atium supply coming from the pits of Hathsin. 
In the process he killed eight Haze killers, soldiers specially trained to handle Mistborn, wearing no armor and carrying no metal, preferring to make use of wood canes and staves or obsidian blades, which their opponents could not manipulate. Kelsia stole a bag of Atium and made it explicit that he was a Mistborn who had attacked House Venture, which was forbidden under an unspoken agreement between the houses and effectively set in motion the civil war. Upon his return, Kelsia began training Vin in using steel and iron, explaining the basic eight metals to her and starting to win over the naturally distrustful orphan. He also introduced her to Sazed, a terrace keeper, one of the few remnants of what had been the terrace people before the Lord Ruler's ascension. The keepers were tasked with preserving knowledge in the hopes of spreading it when the Lord Ruler was toppled. Sazed's speciality was the preservation of the now-dead religions of Skadriel. The plan continued apace, with Kelthia taking on several responsibilities by attacking the Great Houses, attaining information from informants placed around Luthadel, while also spreading misinformation among the noble houses as an informant, all of which further fueled the civil war. The most important of his roles in the long term was his training of Vin, whose talents surpassed his own which would eventually prove decisive. In the meantime, the rebellion continued to amass trained soldiers, approaching the numbers needed for the plan to succeed. Vin, posing as Valette Renault, continued to infiltrate the noble elite by attending balls hosted by the most prominent members of the Great Houses and growing in confidence and stature as an Alamancer due to Kelsia's training. However, the process was not smooth, as Vin recognized her father at the balls and met a certain Elend venture, both of which created further distractions. Her curious nature also placed her in immense danger when she followed Kelsia on a raid upon Credic Shore, where she recovered Elendi's logbook before being gravely injured in the escape. She was saved when Sazed, proficient in Ferukami, intervened, momentarily beating back the Steel Inquisitors before returning with the wounded Vin to Club's hideout. Vin took three months to recover during which the crew members spent time with her, showing how they used their powers as mistings. However, soon the crew learned that the Luthadel garrison was sent out to handle the Scar Rebellion's army. The overconfident Yedin, believing they now had enough soldiers to begin the offensive, had attacked Holstep garrison to gauge the strength of the men he now commanded. Vin and Kelsia set out on a desperate attempt to save the rebellion, but they arrived too late. Having defeated the Holstep garrison in a night raid, Yedin had begun marching his men back to the Argoist caverns when they were attacked on the road by the professionally trained and armoured Valtro garrison of 5,000 men. Kelsia had to be convinced not to join the fray as it was already an apparent defeat. Upon checking the caverns, the Mistborns discovered some 2,000 men. Led by Captain Demo, they had ignored Yedin's orders and stayed in the caverns. Vin and Kelsia led them back to Luthadel, where they were to disperse among the other Scar until again called upon. Following this setback, the crew committed even further to provoking an all-out war between the houses as an alternative to their earlier plan. As the tensions increased, the balls and parties ended, an all-out war was effectively declared between the houses, and alliances were drawn up. The plan seemed to work until Kelsia and Vin went to meet Marsh, who had continued infiltrating the Steel Ministry as the plan progressed. Arriving at the meeting place, they found human remains that Kelsia believed to be his brothers. Furious, he returned to the pits of Hathsin, and using his allomantic power, destroyed all of the Atium, ending its production and freeing the enslaved Scar. This prompted a bloody response from the Lord Ruler. He ordered many Scar to be publicly executed, which would forever alter the rebellion. Unwilling to stand idle, Kelsia intervened, attempting to save the rebels. Before the rebels were brought to execution, he confronted and killed a Steel Inquisitor by beheading him with his obsidian axe, proving they were not immortal. However, the day was not won, as the Lord Ruler emerged. Kelsia was too brave for his own good, so instead of fleeing, he faced the Lord Ruler, whose backhand sent him to the ground, his last words before the Lord Ruler killed him by impaling him with a spear were, But you can't kill me, Lord Tyrant. I represent that one thing you've never been able to kill, no matter how hard you try. I am hope. In a letter that Vin later discovered, 
Kelsia reveals that he had planned to defeat the Lord Ruler using the 11th metal. However, he did not know how to use it in combat, which ultimately led to his demise. Orisur then took Kelsia's bones and began impersonating Kelsia all across the city, making the Scar believe that he was a divine figure who could not be killed. They quickly began to worship Kelsia as a god, and taking inspiration from their deity, rebelled against the Lord Ruler's tyranny across Luthadel, aided by his crew members. In the meantime, Vin made her way to confront the Lord Ruler with the eleventh metal in her possession, hoping it would help her achieve victory. However, she was quickly captured by the Inquisition and imprisoned within Credic Shore to be tortured. Fortunately for her, she was rescued by Sazed, who utilized his Ferukami, allowing her to escape and recover her possessions. Making their way to confront the Lord Ruler, they found Credic Shore to be eerily quiet. At this point, they discovered that Marsh was still alive, with two hemorrhagic spikes protruding from his eye sockets, indicating that he had been made a fully-fledged Inquisitor. Having joined their ranks, Marsh soon learned the core weakness of these seemingly invincible beings. Should the linchpin spike between their shoulder blades be removed, they would die instantly. Taking advantage of this weakness, Marsh had decimated the ranks of the Canton of Inquisition residing within Credic Shore overnight, freeing up the way for Vin to confront the Lord Ruler. The pair met the Lord Ruler in his chambers, and a fight ensued. Vin was brutally outmatched, like Kelsia before her. Reshek combined his powers as a Farukamist and Alamancer, which made him immensely powerful, bordering on the indestructible at this point. As the Lord Ruler was about to kill Vin, she tried to use the eleventh metal, Melatium, an alloy of Atium and Gold. It allowed Vin to see into the past, and she realized that the braces on Reshek's arms were the key. However, she had already used up all of her metals, and death seemed imminent for the young Mistborn. At this point, a huge steel push from the Lord Ruler tore Vin's earring from her ear. It turned out that this had been a hemorrhagic spike that had held Vin back from her true strength. Without knowing how she was doing it, Vin drew strength from the mists and tore the braces from the Lord Ruler's arms. These braces were made of Atium, and using his ferrochemical abilities, the Lord Ruler had utilized them to store his very life essence, making him effectively immortal. Once they were removed, he immediately felt the weight of a millennium's worth of time, aging rapidly. Using this weakness, Vin drove a spear through the supposed Hero of Ages, avenging Kelsia and ending the final empire. However, the final words of the greatest tyrant in Skadriel's history served as an ill portent of what was to come for its denizens. You don't know what I do for mankind. I was your god, even if you couldn't see it. By killing me, you have doomed yourselves. In the dying days of the Lord Ruler's dominion, a bloody revolution was waged upon the streets of Luthadel. The Scar had been persecuted and belittled for close to a millennium. They now chose to reap the crop the nobility had sowed on that bloody night. In their justified anger, they moved through the streets, attacking the domains of the noble houses. As chaos and destruction had begun to grasp at the very hearts of the people of Luthadel, one man, horrified by what he had been forced to witness, refused to allow the chaos to take over and was eager to restore order. It was Elend Venture, who had already become enamoured with Vin, a feeling both parties shared. The son of one of the strongest nobles of the realm, Straff Venture, Elend used the strength of his rhetoric and conviction and proved his true mettle that day. Abandoned by his father, his first action was to bring his guardsmen to keep Lekal to have sufficient numbers to prevent the outright slaughter of their houses. He then came with a token force of five soldiers to personally surrender to Doxen and convince the resistance leader to stop attacking the houses as they would not retaliate if left alone. Doxen then informed him that Vin had made her way to Credic Shore to meet the Lord Ruler head on. This brought a bitter chill to the spine of the heir of House Venture, as the love of his life now faced a supposedly insurmountable task. To buy time for the Mistborn, Elend was joined by a Scar named Gorodel and his soldiers, and led an assault on Credic Shore to buy time for Vin to find a vial of metal that would ultimately save her life and doom the Lord Ruler. He then attempted to find any aid which would be forthcoming for his love. 
In the process, he and Sazed came across a group of bloodthirsty Scar who were slaughtering the palace guard despite their attempts to surrender. Elend could not bear witness to such slaughter, and to the shock of all there, began to speak. The man who considered himself a scholar above all else found courage and spoke against violence. He refused to accept bloodshed and chaos as the foundations of any new state. Unbeknownst to the young scion of House Venture, Breeze worked silently in the background, soothing the anger of the Scar, which made them more willing to listen to the hated nobleman. He continued and shared with the Scar his dream of a brighter, fairer world, one where the central dominance could achieve stability and a better life for all through it. The power of his words tore through the crowd like a torrent, and the anger which had dominated the Scar up until this point was washed away by a tide of emotion as the onlookers proclaimed Elend as the first king of the central dominance. According to Sazed, who told of the event to Vin, the things he said, mistress, his dreams of a new government, his condemnation of bloodshed and chaos. Well, mistress, I fear that I cannot repeat it. I wish I'd had my metal minds so that I could have memorized his exact words. After the downfall of the Lord Ruler had been confirmed, Elend and Vin were immediately presented with positions of immense responsibility. Elend was forced to reinvent his new domain, and attempted to implement many of the philosophies his favoured literature had forwarded as being the correct basis to establish a new political entity. Vin aided in this endeavour through the moral support she provided, and her more recent religious position within the Church of the Survivor. This entity filled that which had been left vacant following the deposition of the Lord Ruler and the Steel Ministry. Without a god to attach their hopes to, the Scar turned to Kelsia, who was revered as the Lord of the Mists following his seeming return from the dead. As someone closest to Kelsia, Vin was granted an exceptionally high status within the Pantheon, with his crew being viewed with a degree of religious fanaticism. All of this came to the chagrin of Sazed, who had made his way into the countryside to revive the long-dead religions of Scadriel. Yet despite his tireless efforts, the attempts at proselytizing the populace could not match the swift expansion of the Church of the Survivor within Luthadel and beyond. In his role as a keeper, Sazed continued to teach the peoples of Scadriel the long-lost knowledge which now existed only in his copper mines. While doing this, he made his way south, as that was the direction from which the rumours of the 11th metal had once reached Kelsia. However, the farther he moved from Luthadel, the more brutal and chaotic the area became. Without the admittedly vicious supervision of the agents of the Lord Ruler, the other dominances had begun to devolve into isolated pockets of civilization amidst a torrent of violence, hatred and bloodshed. These people cared little for religion, and in this regard, Sazed endeavoured to teach them more practical matters to lessen the harshness of their situation. After a year or so of such travels, Sazed began to doubt himself, going so far as to question whether the people would have been better off had the rebellion failed. At this point he also began to happen upon a series of mysterious deaths, which the Scar villagers insisted were due to the mists, which left more questions than answers for the Terrismen. Sazed was found by Marsh, who was still nominally an Inquisitor. He convinced the Terrace Keeper to accompany him to the Conventicle of Seran in the Eastern Dominance, a major stronghold of the Canton of Inquisition, where new Inquisitors were created through the implantation of hemologic spikes. Yet it is not for this reason that Marsh sought to return to this dark and brutal laboratory. Instead, it was because the fortress was now deserted, with all of the servants within slaughtered and the Inquisitors mysteriously absent. Here, Sazed discovered the final words of Quan engraved upon a metal plate, where he admitted to having betrayed Elendi in the end to prevent the completion of his quest. Marsh, however, had begun to act oddly, which was entirely out of character for him. Rather than allow Sazed to translate the inscription on the spot, he forced the keeper to copy it with charcoal. Still, getting this information motivated Sazed to return to Luthadel and begin to research the inscription. However, unbeknownst to Sazed, and perhaps even Marsh, Ruin had begun to influence the Inquisitors through the hemologic spikes, and could now alter most of the texts which were not etched in metal. Sazed promptly left the conventicle, as Marsh had now disappeared, and on his way back, came upon a village where most of the Scar had apparently died of starvation and dehydration within their homes. 
the single survivor claimed that the mists had continued to kill people and have ill effects on the scar. Sazed brought the man to safety while he further decided that his return to Luthadel must be as hasty as possible. There was more wrong with the world than the violence due to the power vacuum left in the Lord Ruler's absence. Sazed now knew that a more evil presence than bandits and warlords was at work in Scadriel. Back in Luthadel, Finn's position within the church granted Elend a degree of legitimacy as the first king of the central dominance. The king now believed his position to be stable enough to integrate a previously unheard of degree of democracy into the governance of the central dominance. He created a new legal framework that established the Luthadel Assembly, a parliamentary council of 24 assemblymen. The representatives came from all classes, eight noblemen, eight scar workers and eight scar merchants. Elent would sit at the head of this assembly whenever they met. However, it was far from plain sailing for Elend, who now felt secure enough in his position to ask for Vin's hand in marriage. Unfortunately, this request was rejected out of hand, much to the king's dismay, as Vin still lacked confidence despite her immense power and believed Elend deserved a better woman. This was to be a portent of what was to come for the fledgling kingdom of the central dominance, as their stability was not to last. The army available to the kingdom was a meager 20,000 poorly trained soldiers. Given the size of Luthadel, it was wholly insufficient to mount a proper defense of the city. This weakness attracted the gaze of several pretenders, eager to ensure that the peace King Elend had imposed would come crashing down around him. Straff Venture, Elend's father, had declared himself king of the northern dominance and brought the area into compliance using brutal methods, much in keeping with his personality and views on the scar. Having done so, he then set his eyes on Luthadel. He viewed his son as a weak puppet, easy to overcome, and wanted to gain access to the fabled Atium Cash of the Lord Ruler. Lord Venture moved swiftly, about a year from the collapse, and brought with him a force of 50,000 soldiers, who he utilized to promptly lay siege to the former capital of the final empire. Yet this was not the full extent of Straff's strength, as he also brought his illegitimate son, Zane, a potent mistborn of questionable sanity. Despite a modicum of discontent within the assembly, Elent managed to pass a proposal that nothing would be done until he parlayed with his father. The situation was further complicated by the emergence of another army of 40,000 men. At its head was Ashweather Ket, an abrasive nobleman from Fadrek's city. Ket's action was initiated by Breeze's soothing, who had convinced the nobleman to make his way to Luthadel. Therefore, a tripartite balance of power had now been created. If Straff or Ket were to attack, it would leave them vulnerable to an assault from the other party. Even if they successfully took the city, the other army would march in and defeat the weakened force, which now held a city with battered defenses and a less than welcoming populace. Not long after, another keeper and old friend of Sazed's, Tindwil, made her way to the capital. Her specialization was entirely different from that of the kindly Sazed, as she focused primarily on leadership and history, which is why we like her more. As such, she immediately began to mentor the young king, often forcefully as his precocious enthusiasm would hold him back in the face of an increasingly dire situation and the apparent cataclysmic events that continued to rock Scadriel. Sazed was not far behind his old friend, but his trip was far more tumultuous than that of his fellow keeper. As he made his way back to Luthadel from the depth of the conventicle, he encountered many Coloss. Although this would ordinarily be a fatal encounter, even for one as powerful as Sazed, the Coloss he met acted strangely. They brought him back to a somewhat chaotic camp and their apparent leader, Justice Lekal. This former friend of Elin's had somehow found himself at the head of a force of some 20,000 Coloss, yet he feared his soldiers as much as any who came across them. This horde of gargantuan blue-skinned warriors was on its way to Luthadel to obtain the Lord Ruler's Atium Cash. Their approach could bring the already delicate balance of power around Luthadel to a breaking point. Sazed was able to talk his way out of captivity and make his way to Luthadel to warn the unwitting members of Kelsia's crew who remained within the city of what was yet to come. He added to the growing list of worries for the first king of the central dominance and the heir of the survivor 
the news that the mists had started killing those who ventured into them. This news was greeted with a degree of skepticism, however. With the arrival of the Coloss, Elend decided to venture out to negotiate with his father, accompanied by Vin. Deep within the venture camp, Elend offered an alliance to his father, allowing his father to believe he was in possession of the Atium Cash. He further argued that Straff could not win without his aid. However, his father responded with an unexpected development. He had already concluded an alliance with Ashweather Ket, and would only ally with Elend if he were to surrender the city to him immediately. The alternative appears to be death. In response, Elend informed his father that Vin would kill Straff if something happened to him. To demonstrate her power, Vin burned brass in conjunction with the newly discovered Duralamin. This metal greatly enhanced the strength of other metals by releasing all of their power in a single use rather than over time. This effectively soothed away all of Straff's emotion, which left him terrified enough to concede and allow the pair to return to the safety of the city walls. Shaken by this, Straff ordered his somewhat insane and mutinous son, Zane, who had already been stalking Zin, to assassinate his fellow Mistborn. While the parley was far from an unmitigated disaster, as Vin and Ellen escaped unharmed, they had merely passed from the frying pan into the flames. The assembly had met without Ellen, utilizing a bylaw that the king had placed within their legal code and passed a motion of no confidence. This immediately deposed the king and set the scene for an unprecedented vote on who would now assume such a lofty role. Ellen and his supporters were caught at total unawares, and the fate of Luthadel, under a triple siege, had never seemed as precarious. This uncertainty played into the hands of the besieging parties, as with the wrong person elected, the city may be surrendered without a fight. Yet hope remained, as the remnants of Kelsius' crew had faced longer odds in the past and emerged from the shade of the Lord Ruler's malice and hatred to forge a new future for their people. Elend and his supporters would not give up the city without a fight, no matter how unlikely their success would be at that point. Elend was disheartened, but he refused to give in and accept the situation he now found himself in. Tindwill, at this point, had already begun tutoring the young man, and her initial efforts focused on improving his presentation. A new uniform tailored for him, a military form of garb in gleaming white, and a new haircut made him look less scholarly and more regal. Her further teaching was centered around improving his directness and degree of authority among his comrades and subjects. However, Tindwill's patience finally vanished upon the deposition of King Elland based on a bylaw he had himself inserted. Initially, the Keeper chastised the deposed king before insisting that he had to seize the throne of the central dominance by utilizing force, ignoring the assembly's will. Elend refused and insisted that it would be through lawful means if he were to reclaim his position as king. Tindwill, irritated by this decision, continued stating that now was not the moment for a legal battle, but Elend refused to listen to her. Questioning his naivety, the keeper asked what the former king would do if his attempts to be recrowned diplomatically were to fail. He said he would continue to help the kingdom in whatever way he could. Despite her fury, Tindwill helped to prepare the speech Elend was to give at the assembly, the crux of which related to his connection to Kelsia's crew through Vin. As the assembly began, Elend nominated a former noble, Fursen Penrod, to preside over the meetings in the absence of a king of the central dominance. The nominations for the successor to the role of king were announced. Penrod had been nominated by a Scar worker, but he then nominated Elend in return for his appointment as chancellor, and at the last moment, a former merchant, Philen Frangiu, proposed the candidacy of Ashweather Ket. The latter had been hiding among the crowd, and unbeknownst to Kelsia's former crew, preoccupied with the events in the assembly, had taken up residence in Keep Hasting with a thousand soldiers. A week would pass with Elend parlaying with Ket regarding the stalemate, although this ultimately proved unsuccessful. The fate of Luthadel hung in the balance until the day of the election. In a last-ditch attempt to sway the scar workers of the city, Elend announced his conversion to the Church of the Survivor, hoping this would cause a deadlock in the vote, allowing him to maintain his position. 
however another player was about to enter the fray. The bastard son of Straff Venture, Zane, who was ordered to kill Vin, and was obsessed with her. In an attempt to show her that she did not belong in Elend's world, he sent half a dozen of Straff's Alamancers to attack Elend and Vin during the election. Vin was forced to kill them, which reminded her that she could be a brutal and efficient killer, and made her question if she was worthy of Elend yet again. Following Vin's successful defense of the assembly, the election occurred in Penrod's mansion. Penrod received 15 votes, Ket 2 and Elend 7, which caused a deadlock, ensuring that Elend would retain his position. However, his honor was to be his undoing once more. When the assembly members asked if they could change their votes, Elend felt obligated to let them know it was possible. The individuals who voted for Ket changed their vote for Penrod, breaking the deadlock and making him the second ever king of the central dominance. Unbeknownst to Elend, Strav had bribed the merchant members of the assembly to vote for Penrod, with the promise of new titles, and convinced Penrod to ally with him against Ket. The only thing which stopped Strav from immediately invading Luthadel was the threat posed by a misborn as potent as Vin. In the aftermath of this crushing defeat and rejection by his people, Elend continued working tirelessly to ensure that the citizens of the besieged city would not die due to the plummeting temperatures, and also to figure out who may be poisoning the water supply of Luthadel. In one of his more reckless actions, however, Elend entered the camp of Jastis Lecal to attempt to persuade his old friend not to attack the city with his coloss. Unwittingly, this further played on Vin's inherent insecurity, with Zane undermining his fellow Mistborn to such an extent that she believed she could not even protect the man she loved. Using that, Zane convinced Vin to assault Kaet in Keep Hasting with his aid. The attack was brutal in its ferocity, as the two Mistborn were able to wipe out a third of the garrison in a matter of moments. The pair then made their way to the inner chamber, where Lord Ket and his son, Neondin, hid before threatening them. Although she initially believed that one or both of the Kets were misborn, this theory was quickly disproven, causing Vin to intervene when Zane attempted to murder the pair in cold blood. Still, following such an efficient decimation of his forces, Ket withdrew from the siege, realizing he was outmatched. Vin, for her part, Fearing she had turned into a shade of what Kelsia once was, with his inherent need to justify wholesale slaughter, hid in an abandoned thieves hideout. While the attack on Keep Hasting was taking place, the negotiation between Elend and Jastis had failed, with the former king learning that Jastis barely controlled his coloss by paying them in worthless coinage. Afterwards, Elend, with the Kandra Orisur in tow, went to meet with Vin who finally told her beloved that she was concerned about her propensity for violence in dire situations. During this conversation, Vin realized that she must leave the city to seek out the Well of Ascension. In the meantime, Sazed and Tindwil used their copper mines, older texts, and the rubbing of Quan's inscription to study the deepness based on Sazed's belief that it had returned with the death of the Lord Ruler, triggering the catastrophic event. During this period, the two became particularly close, with Tindwil acknowledging her feelings for her fellow terrorismen and the ever-cautious Sazid, eventually asking her to remain by his side in the city. Their study of the rubbing brought to light many inconsistencies, chief among them the motivations of Quan for sending Reshek to kill Elendi during the quest to defeat the Deepness. Why would a man of wisdom send someone disreputable like Reshek? And why did he fear that someone as honorable as the Hero of Ages would take power rather than give it up? Without further information about Quan or Ruin's ability to alter all but that which was engraved upon metal, the pair remained unable to decipher the true meaning of the rubbing. Still, both of them were aware that something was inherently wrong. The situation in Luthadel continued to worsen when Vin was confronted again by the smitten Zane. He initially attempted to convince her to leave the city behind and run away with him. However, her love for Elend and duty to Luthadel caused her to refuse. This enraged Zane, who attacked his fellow Mistborn. During the fight, he openly told her how he had attempted to manipulate her throughout the siege. 
A further revelation was made that the Kandra or Sir, who had befriended her during this period, was in fact another Kandra named Tensun, who was contracted to Zane. Tensun had slain Orisur and taken his place, however he had become immensely fond of Vin and now considered her a friend. The fight once more seemed hopeless for Vin, as Zayn burned Atium, and her attempts to draw from the mist proved to be in vain, as she remained unaware that her earring continues to act as a hemorrhagic spike. However, it was to be Tensun's fondness for her which was to prove fortuitous in the fight, as he subtly showed her that a Kandra could be controlled by a Mistborn using a Durilumin enhanced soothing. She then commanded the Kandra to attack Zane, but that wasn't enough and Vin was wounded. Now cornered and without Atium, she had to use her wits and inherent talent as a Mistborn to beat her counterpart. She turned the foresight granted to Zane by Atium and his madness against him, stabbing Ellen's half-brother in the neck and killing him. She was forced to listen to Tensoon's confession in her injured state. Breaking a contract was a great shame, and the Kandra were supposed to be utterly loyal to the holder of their contracts. As such, Tensoon left the city to return to the Kandra homeland to be tried for his crimes. Meanwhile, Vin made her way to Eland, who immediately insisted that Sazed heal her. Although she consented to his request, it would be upon one condition. Elend accepts her marriage proposal. The couple were wed in fittingly unconventional ways, with Sazed acting as the officiant. Soon after, the pair left the city with Spook, as Vin remained confident that she must now find the Well of Ascension and give up her power, as Elendi was allegedly supposed to in the time before Reshek's ascension. To get them as far from the city as possible before the Colossus were unleashed upon Luthadel, Sazed falsely informed them that the well was in Deritatith, a mountain high in the terrace dominance. However, a group followed the trio, foremost among them Justice Lekal. Elend, angered beyond all belief by the reckless acts of his friend in bringing a Colossus army to the gates of the world's largest city and leaving them bereft of any form of leadership, had Justice executed. Having witnessed the execution, the timid spook revealed Sazed's deception. An immediate realization then occurred to Vin that the Lord Ruler had moved the well to Credic Shore when he remade the world to ensure he would be in control once the well was refilled. In a desperate dash back to the city, Vin utilized Pewter before pulling and pushing horseshoes to get her back to Luthadel. The situation back in the city on the eve of the Battle of Luthadel was desperate. Straff Venture, making use of the advice of his now deceased bastard son, decided to hold back his army until the Coloss had effectively ravaged the city, leaving it easy pickings for his 50,000 strong contingent. In the absence of Vin and Elend, the desperate defense of the city fell to Doxon, who was forced to place a paltry thousand soldiers at each of the gates. Aware that they would not hold long in the face of the ferocious onslaught of a Coloss charge, contingencies to retreat to the keeps of the nobility were further put in place. Sazed and Tindwil also joined the defenders. The battle began with club scouts raising the alarm as Coloss started to work themselves into a bloody frenzy. The Tin Gate, to which Tindwil was granted command, was the first to face the onslaught with the Pewter and Zinc Gates coming under immense pressure soon after. While the defences held firm, particularly that of the Steel Gate, with Sazed fighting fiercely there, it was not long before the unending tides of Colos proved too great for the defenders. The Zinc Gate was to fall first, followed by the Tin Gate, as Tindwil was cut down while attempting to lead her men back to keep Venture, a decision that was followed by many of the commanders of the other gates. The retreat was a desperate affair, with casualties mounting, clubs and Doxon among them. The former died saving Breeze from a Coloss blade, while Doxon was brought low by the overwhelming might of the enormous blue warriors as his strength began to fade. By the time the sun set, Keep Lekal and Keep Venture had been stormed by the Coloss. As a result, only Keep Hastings stood firm with thousands of soldiers gathered to protect King Penrod from the Blue Tide. Half exhausted from her travels, Vin arrived at dusk, and although her arrival was a welcome boost to the defenders, it did not turn the tide immediately. 
Initially, all the Mistborn could do was cover the soldiers' retreat as they made their way from the faltering battle lines. Yet despite the success, Vin knew she could not maintain such an effort indefinitely. At that point in the battle, only 5,000 men remained to face down the bloodthirsty 12,000 Koloss. As the struggle became increasingly desperate, Vin's thoughts turned to the knowledge she got from Tensoon, and she discovered that a sufficiently strong Mistborn could control the Koloss through a combination of brutal decimation of their strongest warriors and the burning of brass. Fortunately for the city's defenders, Vin represented one of the greatest Mistborn of her age, and the remaining Koloss were soon brought to heel. However, the battle was not yet won, as Straff Venture and his 50,000 remained outside the city, poised to take the former capital of the final empire. However, as the sun rose upon a battered city, Straff Venture gazed not upon a broken people, but a force of 12,000 Koloss upon the plain to the west of the city. The earth shook once more as the Koloss charged, yet Straff's end came long before the two lines met. Vin utilized Duralumin once more, in conjunction with Steel on this occasion, to make one mighty leap across the battlefield. With an immense Koloss blade in her hand, she proceeded to cut down the head of House Venture, and the city was saved. Soon after, Ashweather Ket arrived with his 40,000 soldiers to support the city. Vin, now ascendant in her power, forced Penrod, Ket, and Straff's second, Janal, to submit to the new empire, with the absent Elend declared its first emperor. Upon his arrival, Elend was informed of his new position. However, there were more pressing issues at hand, so the newly married couple quickly made their way to Credic Shore, where they discovered the refilled well hidden within the storage cache. Sazed had, at this point, discovered the broken body of Tindwil and had lost all faith in his religions, which caused him to return to his studies of the rubbings. However, before he could intervene in Vin's unwittingly destructive endeavours, with the realisation that the rubbings had been altered, the Terrace Keeper was attacked by Marsh and survived only with the intervention of Ham, who had recovered from the battle with the aid of Vin's remaining pewter. Inside the well, what remained of preservation appeared to the couple as a missed spirit. Preservation attempted to vainly dissuade them from their current course of action. Aware that Vin, like Elendi before her, was so pure of heart that she would give up ultimate power to save Scadriel, unaware of Ruin's interference with the prophecies. When this initial attempt proved futile, Preservation mortally wounded Elend by stabbing him, hoping Vin would take up the power to save him. However, Vin believed that even as he lay there dying, Elend would only want what was best for his people, and as such she gave up the power and felt a great dread as Ruin was now freed from his prison. Preservation, although he now despaired at the release of his great nemesis and the imminent destruction of his prized creation, ensured Vin she would not be left alone in the struggle to come. A mist wraith led the heartbroken Vin to what remained of the well and convinced her to give a Larassian bead to her dying husband. This turned him into a mistborn and through the burning of pewter saved the life of the emperor. Despite the best efforts of preservation, Vin's innately good nature ensured that even when presented with nigh on immeasurable power, she would do what she believed to be correct. As such, Ruin returned to the world, and Scadriel was altered fundamentally in many ways. Chief among them was the return of the mists during the day. As Sazed had discovered at an earlier point, these mists were capable of laying low even the strongest of warriors, seemingly killing at random as some remained unaffected. With the mists spreading throughout the outlying dominances, more and more of the world became uninhabitable as the dragnet tightened upon those who had persevered through the collapse and now faced the end of times. This force was time infinite. It was the winds that weathered, the storms that broke, the timeless waves running slowly, slowly, slowly to a stop as the sun and the planet cooled to nothing. It was the ultimate end and destiny of all things, and it was angry. Kelsier. In these times of chaos, the new empire, with Elend as its monarch, provided an island of stability and calm. 
Yet consolidation alone would not be sufficient, as the world seemed to be imploding before the very eyes of the foremost members of the empire. Therefore, a proactive approach was taken, with the strategy by Vin and Elend revolving around the recovery of five storage caches. The Lord Ruler put these caches in place as a failsafe, should he be deposed prior to the Well of Ascension refilling. Just as this situation occurred, the caches provided critical resources and knowledge essential in the fight against the Deepness. Or so Vin and Elend came to believe. They also provided evidence that despite his cruel methods and tendency to lean towards outright tyranny, the Lord Ruler cared for the people of Scadriel and their ultimate fate. The first cavern containing such a cache was uncovered on the night the well was revealed beneath Credic Shore. Within this cache was shelving containing canned food and a large metal plaque upon the far wall of the cavern. It showed a map of the final empire, with Statlin City circled, indicating that the next cache was there. Each cache would contain such a metal engraving, as Reshek had known that despite Ruin's supposed imprisonment, it could still corrupt all that was not written on metal, altering it to fit his purposes. Kelsia's former crew had discovered Ruin's corruption of the texts after the Siege of Luthadel. Sazed, heartbroken by the death of Tindwil, realized that the rubbing of Quan's inscription had been changed. Aware that their only hope of countering Ruin and his deepness lay in these caches, they set about tracking down the remaining caverns. In the process, Vin, Elend, and their soldiers were forced to fight the Inquisitors, who Ruin now controlled through their hemologic spikes. The new empire won a number of battles in this period, and each victory would bring increasing numbers of Koloss to their side. In the meantime, Tensoon had returned to the Kandra homeland in order to face judgement for betraying the contract and disobeying the holder of his contract, Zane, during the latter's battle with Vin. For his actions he was imprisoned by the first among the second generation of Kandra, Kan Pa, who utilised Chan Ga. This ritual essentially consisted of the breaking of the Kandra's bones, and after this they were sealed in a pit, with only a singular hole with which the prisoner can be fed. The offending Kandra was then left there for ten generations of claustrophobic isolation, and after this period was allowed to die of starvation. Sazed had assumed the role of chief ambassador of the new empire, with his first task being negotiations with Ordeal Lecal. Ordeal was the uncle of Justice and had assumed the kingship of his faltering domain following his nephew's execution at the hands of Elend Venture. Although he ultimately acceded to the demands of the Emperor, swearing fealty and surrendering his independence, he did so reluctantly. Despite this success and a year passing since the death of Tindwil, Sazed remained a mere shade of the man he once was. In his despair, he would no longer wear his copper mines and would instead go through each of the religions he had formerly proselytized. In his search for an answer as to the existence of the divine, he would seek out contradictions in their respective creeds, and should he find any, he would write alongside the debunked mythos, religion not true. As Sazed despaired, and Tensoon faced a slow death at the hands of his Kandra brethren, Elend and Vin continued to act as solitary beacons of hope to the ever-dwindling populace of Skadriel. The second cache was found easily within the central dominance, and contained large amounts of lumber alongside a description of the metal aluminum. And while a helpful discovery, it was not the silver bullet they sought, and that would require the upper echelons of the new empire's leadership to range farther afield than the central dominance in search of answers. Spook was sent to Erto to investigate the new rulership there under a scar named Quellian, who took the title of The Citizen. This government worshipped Kelsia as the Lord of the Mists, and propagated a brutal campaign against the nobility in their lord's name, which led them to believe they were the only city to have genuinely adhered to the tenets laid down by the survivor. Unfortunately for the residents of Erto, even their deity couldn't supply their city with water. Spook was soon joined by Sazed and Breeze, accompanied by a few hundred soldiers, to secure the cash there. Vin and Elend were not idle during this period either, as they made their way to Vititan in the southern dominance. This city was now ruled by a Scar named Fatren, 
who had assumed leadership when the local nobility and members of the steel ministry had abandoned the region. Through clever political maneuvering, Fatren kept his people safe and raised a garrison of a thousand soldiers, supplemented by a thousand unskilled reserves. However, as the mist grew denser, the city's crops failed, an issue which was worsened when an army of Colos destroyed the nearby city of Garthwood, drawing some hundred refugees into the city. Although preparations were made, including raising an earthen rampart outside the city, some three months after the destruction of Garthwood, a force of 10,000 Colos set their sights on Vititan. Despite being a capable leader in many respects, Fatran was now sure that his people were doomed. That was, of course, until Elend Venture entered the fray. The Emperor arrived in the nick of time to teach the garrison how to fight the Colos. In return, he demanded that Fatren bend the knee to him. Despite Fatren's immense hatred towards the nobility, due to his treatment at their hands during the final empire, he recognized in Elend a ruler worth following and acquiesced to his demands. From this point, Elend would take charge of the garrison and use the leadership skills that Tindwell had imparted upon him to inspire his men to sally out and meet the Coloss. This surprised the gargantuan blue warriors as they were setting up their camp in preparation for their assault, and hundreds of them were slain in the initial sally. Although this shocked the Coloss, the battle soon hung upon a knife's edge, with naught more than Ellen's charisma to keep his soldiers in check until Vin finally arrived. She immediately engaged the Inquisitor who controlled the Coloss. In a fierce duel, she dispatched the Inquisitor in time to save much of the fighting force of the city. This allowed Elend to utilize his emotional allomancy to take control of the Coloss, ending the battle and saving the city. As soon as the battle was won, Elend and Vin searched for the storage cache, which they quickly located. Within the cache was a substantial amount of supplies of food, water, and the first eight alimentic metals. The metal inscription contained information on the use of emotional alimentcy on Kolos and Kandra, the existence of an eleventh metal known as Malatium, which was a counter to Atium, and the location of another cache within Fadrek's city. Elent was then forced to evacuate the city, bringing the peoples of Vititan to Luthadel with him, as the city, despite being capably run and independent, was well outside the defensive perimeter maintained by the armies of the new empire. This decision was not taken lightly, as many of the scar that Elend brought with him died from the sickness caused by the mist. There were no easy choices in the dying days of Scadriel, nor was it an easy decision on Elend's part to march a force of some 40,000 soldiers, 20,000 Colos, and a sizable detachment of Alamancers to Fadrek's city. However, the storage caches and the ever-darkening days of the world he fought so bravely to protect justified such a move. Upon his arrival, the imposing fortifications and garrison, in conjunction with the casualties which would be wrought should he unleash the full wrath of his Colos upon the city's people, effectively forced Elen's hand. At the same time, the implacable leader of the city, Aradan Yomen, was a former obligator who still yearned for the days of the final empire and maintained his loyalty to the Lord Ruler. To avoid bloodshed, Elend dug in, deciding to besiege the city. Spook, meanwhile, displayed a newfound confidence and capacity for leadership in Erto, undermining Quellian's government and inadvertently falling in love with his sister, Beldre. However, this came at a cost, as the continued excessive use of his powers as a tin eye left him so sensitive to light that he was forced to wear a blindfold at all times. Fortunately, his other enhanced senses compensated for this. During his time in Erto, he attended the execution of ten noblemen and made his way to Beldre, where he inadvertently revealed himself to Quellian's Alamancers. They quickly swarmed the Tinai, managing to wound him. A tip of a sword broke off in Spook's arm, becoming a hemorrhagic spike, which allowed Spook to burn pewter. However, it also allowed Ruin access to his mind, allowing him to impersonate Kelsia and manipulate the young man. By following the advice of Ruin, Spook would escape his execution by burning down the building that served as his prison. The escape allowed him to meet with Breeze and Sazed, with the group making their base in the cavern containing the cache. 
This cache contained an immense amount of water to fill Erto's canals, alongside information on Electrum, which allowed the Alamancers burning it to see potential futures for themselves a few seconds ahead. Confirmation of Reshek's oddly caring nature, despite the state he had founded in the aftermath of taking power, was also evidenced upon the metal plaque. If I am dead, then these caches will provide some measure of protection for my people. I fear what is coming, what might be. If you read this now and I am gone, then I fear for you. Still, I will try to leave what help I can. Although Spook wanted to confide in Sazed about the nature of the voices he now heard, the Keeper's unusually despondent nature in the face of his lost faith made him relent at the last minute. Now maintaining the title of Survivor of the Flames, Spook continued undermining Quellian's leadership by interfering in his executions and killing his soldiers due to Ruin's influence. Leading the group sent by Elend, he further convinced Sazed to reverse engineer the water supply found in the cache to allow him to bring a miracle to Erto. Ruin's influence had grown exponentially, and the kind, unassuming Spook was making decisions firmly out of character, ultimately bringing the city to the verge of destruction. He initially met with Beldre and hoped to sway her to his side. However, he took her captive when she rejected his advances and brought her back to the cache. He would then return to the city proper and interrupt one of Quellian's speeches. Utilizing the discontent within the city, Spook attacked the platform. Empowered by Pewter, he was able to slay Quellian's guards and was about to take his foe's life when his sister Beldre, having broken free, shot coins at Spook, revealing herself to be an Alamancer. This enraged the populace, who realized that Quellian had been an unrelenting hypocrite, slaughtering those who possessed noble blood, but keeping his sister safe throughout his time as king. Riots broke out and the city was set on fire, Spook also felt betrayed, and Ruin's voice pushed him to kill her and take her spike to use her power. Instead, this led Spook to understand that they were manipulated through the spikes. Spook first removed Quellian's spike before his own, regaining full awareness for the first time since his initial battle with the citizens' soldiers. The Tinai now gazed upon a city aflame. However, the water from the cache was not forthcoming which led Beldre to admit that she had slain the guards in her escape. With Sazed in tow, they rushed back to the cache. The building housing the cache was likewise aflame. As the trio seemed set on abandoning their initial plan, Kelsia's voice once more came to Spook, encouraging him to continue the fight. Spook rushed into the building, but as the heat and smoke began to weigh upon him, sapping the tin eye of his strength, he could barely throw his weight against the machine to get it moving before he collapsed and lost consciousness. However, he saved the city in the process and redeemed himself of the taint with which Ruin had infected him. As we detailed previously, the storage caches left behind by the Lord Ruler provided vital information to Elend and Vin in their struggle against the now ascendant Ruin. While four of them had now been secured by the combined efforts of Kelsia's former crew, one final hurdle remained in the guise of Aradan Yeoman, the former obligator and current ruler of Fadrek's city. As Elend remained unwilling to engage in the wholesale slaughter of the city's populace at the hands of his coloss, he initiated a siege while engaging in talks with Yeoman. The peril of such negotiations was diminished by the sheer power of the Emperor and the Empress as Alamancers. Knowing they were safe due to their magic, Elend and Vin attended a ball within Keep Oriel, deep within Fedrex. While the discussion began in a typical fashion, it soon turned to a lively debate on philosophy, culminating in Yomen declaring Elend a hypocrite for taking power by force. This initial discussion was an unmitigated failure forcing Elend to accept the brutal advice of his counsellor Ashweather Ket. He had the wells of the city poisoned, and warned the city's residents of the poisoning, thereby placing Yomen under increased pressure to return to the negotiating table. In response, Yomen initiated a devastating counterattack, with forces sallying out from the north and south to engage in several small raids. These raids were a distraction. With Elend and Vin focused on repelling the sallies, 
the catapults upon the city walls, and another raiding party assaulted the unattended Koloss. 11,000 Koloss were slaughtered, either by way of the hell rained down upon them by the catapults, or the bloodlust which triggered them to fight each other. The overall balance of power now swung towards Yomen. Aware that he no longer possessed the strength at arms to storm the city even if he wished to do so, Elend was forced to re-enter it once more. He did so with his empress as they elected to attend a ball hosted by Yomen in the former canton of resource. This was merely a ruse to buy time for Vin to search for the cash. Yet it was in fact Yomen who was distracting the emperor, still two steps ahead of the Alamances. As an Atium misting, he was capable of predicting the future, so he had Finn captured and imprisoned during her investigation. Unable to do anything else, Elend left the city furious at his failures and set aside his initial pacifism. Taking to the field alone, he assaulted a force of 28,000 Koloss and in his fury broke their will, bringing them under his control. And his army of Koloss now numbered some 37,000 strong. Elend then prepared to storm the city, a decision which initially seemed unconscionable. With time ticking ever onward, and his wife's life in the balance, this was the only course left to him. Back in the Kandra homeland, matters were also coming to a head. Tensoon was slowly being starved to death within the depths of the Warrens, and plotted his escape to aid his previous master Vin. Milan, a Kandra of the seventh generation, asked him to lead a rebellion against the first and second generation which ruled their kind. However, he remained unwilling to fight his kind. When asked what he thought of the wolfhound body he wore, Tensoon responded that he hated it, aware that members of the fifth generation were monitoring their conversation. Therefore, for his sentencing, Tensoon was ordered to wear the wolfhound bones, and as the sentence was called out, he used the speed of his new body to escape. Meanwhile, Sazed, having finished his religious research in Erto, now despaired that no true faith had survived the ascension of the Lord Ruler. However, he was saved by a chance meeting with the fugitive Tensoon. The Wolfhound named him the Announcer. In their conversation, Sazed learned that the first generation of the Kandra were Rashek's original Terris companions, and his religion was not yet lost to him. Sazed then accompanied Tensoon to the Kandra homeland. In the conversation along the way, he learned of ruin and preservation, which led him to a vital realization. Atium was in fact the body of ruin, and it was all located within the pits of Hathsin. Unfortunately, disseminating such information became increasingly difficult as the end times drew ever closer. This was evidenced through the capture of Gorodel by Marsh, who bore with him the note for Vin that her earring was actually a hemallergic spike. This was, however, to have unexpected consequences during the dying days of Scadriel. Upon Sazed's arrival, he would meet with the mysterious first generation, who spoke to him of the resolution. This prophecy stated that with the end of times, the Kandra would have to kill themselves by removing their spikes and returning to their Mistwraith form. The second generation, having heard of this suicide pact, rebelled against their elders. Led by Kanpa, they overthrew the first generation and imprisoned them alongside Sazed. Tensoon, in conjunction with Milan of the seventh generation, would then fight through the second generation to free the imprisoned with the help of the first generation regenerate. Unfortunately, Ruin's influence was such that he took control of Tensoon, having him attack the weakened keeper and almost kill him. However, Hadek of the first generation called upon his kin to engage in the resolution and they all became Mistwraiths once more. Sazed would leave the Warren having fully recovered his faith, and firmly believed Vin was the Hero of Ages. While Ruin's machinations were foiled in this instance, Elend still grappled with the burdens he now bore, and on his return journey to Fadrix, he gave in to despair. Elend knelt in the ash and seemed ready to surrender, yet Preservation's current shardholder, Leris, came to him as a mist spirit. Although his power was much reduced, he could answer some of Elend's questions, advising that he should not attack Fadrek city, and that Ruin could potentially be defeated. Yet this consumed what remained of Leris's power, 
and alone in the ash falls of a broken world, the power of the shard preservation was released. Leris's body then dropped lifeless among the cold embers of the world he had strived for so long to protect. He failed even in his final actions, as Elend was to ignore his advice, and the Emperor decided upon a surprise attack on Fadrex the following morning. Fortunately for the denizens of Fadrex and Elend's army alike, a member of Kelsia's crew, Ham, wise in the ways of war, finally convinced his liege lord not to assault the city, thwarting Ruin's plans. Ruin was not one to accept defeat, however. Although Elend withdrew his troops, heeding the advice of his general, Ruin took control of the Coloss using their hemologic spikes and began attacking the human portion of Elend's army. At this point, Vin convinced Yomen to open his gates and allow Elend's forces to retreat beyond the city's imposing walls before she escaped and made her way to Luthadel. At this point, as the city was faced with an insurmountable force of Coloss, Elend finally discovered the true power of the mists. The mist sickness was snapping the scar, causing those who fell to become Alamancers. However, even with these Alamancers supplementing his army, the force of Coloss was too great. Fortunately for Fadrex, the Coloss suddenly began to retreat and make their way toward Luthadel. Yomen handed Elend the last of his Atium beads, and the Emperor began to make his way toward the capital in search of his wife and Empress. Vin, meanwhile, had reached a now deserted Luthadel, as the surviving citizens had made their way to the Terrace Keepers. However, the city was not entirely devoid of life, for Ruin had sent the full might of his Inquisitors, Marsh included, against the supposed Hero of Ages, who, despite her immense allomantic might, struggled to keep them at bay in the battle above Credic Shore. Despite Ruin's control over Marsh, his attention was drawn away momentarily, which allowed Kelsia's brother to exercise his immense willpower to bring hope once more to all who fought on behalf of the remnants of Scadriel. In doing so, he tore the earring from Vin, which her brother Reen had given to her, unaware it was a hemologic spike. Due to the intercepted message, Marsh knew it to be a spike, withholding the true extent of her power. Vin could then absorb the mists, which allowed her to destroy all of the Inquisitors, bar Marsh. This was because Vin, now unrestrained, took up the power of preservation. Just as she was about to remove the last of his spikes, the immense power vaporized her body, allowing Marsh to escape. Vin then battled with Ruin in her attempts to save Scadriel. However, she was inexperienced with such power in much the same way Reshek was. It was never Vin's place to right the world. Elend would arrive in Luthadel too late, and upon entering an empty city, he discovered the corpse of his one-time foe, Furson Penrod. Upon his person was a note, which stated that Elend's subjects had made their way to the terrace dominance. Yet Ruin, locked in combat with Vin, could still influence all that was not written upon metal, and if not for Vin's intervention by whispering to Elend that they had gone to the terrace people, all might have been lost. The Emperor, whose empire was now disintegrating before his very eyes, made with all haste to what remained of his people, and arrived at the pits of Hathsin to see that his general, Demo, now led what remained of the Luthadel garrison. This meagre force was supplemented by the Misfallen, who had snapped. This was complemented by the Atium stores held within the pits, which Sazed had led them to. They prepared for one final stand against the Coloss Horde, now threatening to wash over them in a wave of fury and destruction. The battle would be waged for hours, with the stalwart defenders imposing a heavy price for every inch of ground they gave, aware that even as the world seemed sure to end, all that would be left to them was a single spark of defiance. At the forefront of the battle was Elend Venture, who fought with every last ounce of his being, unaware that Vin was now forced to watch on throughout the desperate struggle for the very fate of Scadriel. The Atium cash soon began to run low, and at this point, Marsh, once again controlled by Ruin, entered the fray and immediately attacked Elend, who fought back using the Atium Can Pa had given him. With all other metals but Atium burned, the battle was one-sided, until an apparition of Vin appeared and Elend's metals were restored. Elend then burned Atium in conjunction with Durelamin, 
allowing him to see Preservation's entire plan, which required him to die. As Marsh cut him down, he informed the Inquisitor that he had won. With all of the Atium gone, Ruin's body was destroyed, leaving him vulnerable. Vin was then forced to witness Ellen's beheading, and with this, the final thread which bound her to Scadriel was cut. Heartbroken to an unimaginable extent, Vin then launched herself at Ruin head-on. With the power of preservation behind her, this was to have deadly consequences, as both Vin and Atti, the holder of Ruin, were killed in the struggle. With Vin now dead, it was left to Sazed to come across his fallen friend's body. This came with the familiar pang of despair which had become a part of his life for so long in the recent past. Yet this flashed by him in a heartbeat, and with it came a stark realization. Vin wasn't the hero of ages, it was him. The hero would be rejected of his people, Sazed thought, yet he would save them, not a warrior though he would fight, not born a king, but would become one anyway. Sazed knew now that the fate of Skadriel lay in his hands. Therefore, he took up the power of both ruin and preservation. The Terrasman utilized all the information he had garnered as a keeper, reshaping the world in a way that Reshek and Vin alike could not. Skadriel would come to be much like it was before the ascension of the Lord Ruler, with some changes on Sazed's part. In the process, he became a god known as Harmony through the combination of ruin and preservation, in an event which would come to be called the Final Ascension. In this new world, Sazed would leave the complete but firmly deceased bodies of Vin and Elend for Spook and the other survivors. With them was a book which detailed all that had happened to those who would now inherit the land Sazed had built for them. Yet in returning the bodies of Elend and Vin, he allowed the couple, whose love for one another was only matched by their love and dedication towards the people of Scadriel, a fitting and final rest. In conjunction with this book, he left a note for Spook, which detailed his failed efforts to revive Vin and Elend, and how he had cured Spook of the damage he had caused himself by flaring tin over the years. So ends the first era of Scadriel, and with it the tales of Vin and Elend. Yet this is but our first foray into the Cosmere. We hope to cover many more of the works of Brandon Sanderson in the future. Still, for now, we're planning to cover the battles of many other fantasy, sci-fi and space opera universes, so make sure you have subscribed and pressed the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing as it helps immensely, and don't forget to comment. We'll try to read and respond to every comment, as we want to know what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.